O oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name, tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples, for great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Let's pray. Father, you do fill our heart with song. It is a celebration of your majesty and your greatness. It is an expression of thanks for your gifts of love and kindness, your care, your provision for us each and every day. And so we gather today to lift up our hearts and praise, to lift up our minds and our lives, to go forth and to serve you with joy this week as a response to all that you have done and all that you continue to do on our behalf and in our lives. And we will praise you for that. In Jesus' matchless name, amen and amen. Thanks for joining us for the online ministry of the First Congregational Church of Wyndham. We're pleased to be able to come to you each time and that you have chosen to be with us today. I'd like to begin in Matthew chapter 16, reading verses 21 to 28. It uh, is after the passage where Peter confesses that Jesus is the Christ, and it, immediately he moves in to this. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. You're not setting your mind on things of God, but the things of men. And Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world but forfeits his soul? What shall a person give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in glory and the glory of the Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Let's pray. Father, as we bow our heads and our hearts this morning, we seek to be still before you from all that's going on in the world around us. We seek that this place be a sanctuary, that it be a holy place where we have the privilege of coming and bowing before you. Lord, on this side of the cross, with the veil, the curtain in the temple torn in two from top to bottom, it signifies that presence, your presence is open to us to seek. And, and we have the privilege of gathering before you. And, and the, the, the throne that was the, the mercy seat is certainly there. The, the throne is the throne of grace. And it is the place that we have the privilege of coming to find help in our time of need. And so in that, Lord, we want to seek you today. Father, in a little bit, we're going to be turning to think of, of Stephen. And Stephen experienced some of the things that Jesus uh, talked about here in Matthew chapter 16. And many other believers since Stephen have experienced the loss of property the loss of relationship, even the loss of life because of their commitment to you. Lord, we may not know anyone personally in our own relationships, but we can think back of Christians that we've heard of, of, of uh, Jim Elliott, of um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer in Germany in World War II. Um, many around the world suffer death for their faith in Christ. And... We just want to think of their families today. We want to think of, of people who have experienced such hardship and such heartache. 
and we lift them up today. We thank you for people who support them and who care for them. We just pray, Lord, for your provision in their lives uh, even now. Lord, we think of people in our own lives dealing with loss. Some friends dear to our congregation have been walking through a very deep valley of the shadow of death. And we pray, Father, for your grace to be multiplied in their lives, for them to know your comfort and your peace. And we want to thank you for that now. We think of those who are on the path of cancer, and those who are on the path of dementia, and those who are in the path of, of other difficult ailments. And we want to lift them up to you today. And we ask that you would hear us, Lord, as in the quietness of these moments, we lift them all up to you now. Hear us, we ask. Lord, as we have the privilege of ministering to these people, we pray that we would have uh, open ears, that we would have caring hearts, that he, we would have wise and appropriate words, and that you would use us to help them draw closer to Christ in the midst of their struggle. And as we think of them struggling, Lord, our hearts would turn to our friends down uh, in Haiti, especially along the western and southern branch where Lakai is and our friends from Bethesda Evangelical Mission. Lord, um, Haiti is still very difficult. Uh, it seemed to be making a little progress and then hearing in the news, it doesn't seem to be at all. And so we pray, Father, for your provision and for your deliverance of these people from evil. We ask, Lord, that you would raise up the people who would lead with honor and honesty and dignity and they would have victory over those troublers um, who seem to, to have the day right now. So I just want to lift them up to you and um, thank you for the privilege of supporting our brothers and sisters in prayer. Speak to our hearts as we turn back to your word, we ask in Jesus' name. This morning brings us to the book of Acts, and I'm going to be reading from Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. I'm going to start with verse 1. In these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews, because the Hellenist widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. The twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicolaus, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and the apostles prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. A great conflict arose over that, and Stephen's address in verse seven, in chapter seven, is in his response. And at the conclusion of his address, the people were not they, they were not happy. Verse fifty four. When they heard the things that Stephen said, they were enraged. <clears throat> they ground their teeth at him. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven, saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, 
Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city and they stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. As they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep, and Saul approved of his execution. May God strengthen us in the reading and the hearing and the doing of his holy word. Over these weeks since Easter, we have considered Thomas's story and, and how faith in the resurrection transformed Thomas's life. Thomas the skeptic, Thomas the doubter, and Jesus met him in that place and Jesus restored him and delivered him from that and just helped strengthen him. We, we thought about Peter, who Jesus met in his shame and in his failure, in his denials, and the grace and mercy of forgiveness and the restoration of Peter to, to a role of great leadership in the founding of the church. We've also considered John and summarized what John does is true, true, true. The message is true. The gospel is true. Jesus is true, and by his resurrection, we have life, and he calls us to faith and trust in Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. This morning, we come to Stephen. What a story is Stephen's life. What a man of God, probably the greatest of all of the lesser characters in the pages of the New Testament. All that we learn about Stephen is contained in two chapters and two verses. But what we have learned and what we will learn and we'll consider this morning, and if you haven't read Acts 6 and 7, I encourage you to do so and just be more familiar with Stephen's ministry and what took place in his life. But what we learn and observe helps us to understand the truth of a passage in Hebrews chapter 13. Where believers, you and I, are encouraged and exhorted, remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Why? Because the Jesus Christ whom they believed and they preached, whom they served, is the same yesterday as he was then, as he is today, and as he is forever. So we can confidently say that that Lord, the Lord Jesus, is our helper. I will not fear. What can people do to me? For he will never leave he will never forsake. I propose to you that this describes Stephen and all that we read and all that he endured. If you have your Bibles, again, turn them back to Acts 6 because we're going to begin there in just a minute. Stephen, someone who becomes a great leader, someone who becomes a strong and vital servant and his life is dramatically transformed by an experience with the risen Lord Jesus. It doesn't happen in the pages of scripture. It has happened before we met him, but it is evident in his life and all that he has done. What is the foundation for Stephen's life change? What is the foundation of this experience? Well, we read a little bit in Acts chapter 6, and in order to really grasp Acts chapter 6, you have to understand some of the significant cultural issues uh, that were coming into play in the early church. This is maybe about four years after the resurrection. The church is about four years old, and it has been growing gangbusters. It is comprised of people who are Hebrews, as the Bible says. They are Jews, Jewish believers who have probably always lived in Judea, in what you and I would call the Holy Land, and their language is Hebrew, and their customs are very, very Jewish. But as, as the church was growing, and actually when we started with Pentecost and people coming from all over the Roman Empire, you would have Jews that live in other parts of the Roman Empire, and they're much more exposed to the predominant Grecian kind of culture 
that had dominated the land of Israel for a couple hundred years uh, in BC. And so they would be apt to speak Greek. They, they wouldn't speak the Hebrew dialect or, or Aramaic, which was the spoken language. They, they would be more culturally attuned to Greek customs and, and Greek ideas and Greek culture. Well, they became two separate kinds of groups in, uh, in this early church. And, and what happens here is, could be the basis for a tremendous explosion and a, a very great difficulty within the life of the church. Apparently, the early church had adapted and adopted customs from the early synagogues. And that is that as people were in need, they would collect money and it would be distributed. Money or food would be distributed before the Sabbath each week, and that would seek to help people. And that seems to be the basis for what's happening here. The early church was continuing on because when people became Christians, they would not any longer have fellowship in the synagogue. So the early church would distribute, and the problem was apparently the, the Jewish believers, the Hebrew believers, we're getting it all, and, and the Hellenistic, or the Greek believers, were not. They're, they're Jewish, but they're of the Greek, more of a Greek culture. And so the, the Hellenists, they call it, uh, felt like they were being discriminated against. Um, and the compassionate care of money, of food and things, and they were being overlooked. Well, Peter and the rest of the apostles came up with a solution. And that was not to tell them what to do and design a program or anything, but to say, okay, you select some people. You select some leaders who are full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, and you let them handle this. And that's what happens in the first paragraph. They come together and they select seven individuals. Um, the first one is Stephen. The interesting thing is that all of them have Greek names. So all of them are Jews who have been a part of more Grecian culture. They all have Greek names, and one's actually a Gentile who converted to Judaism, who converted to Christianity. Well, the first name, the name that we read is Stephen. And uh, Luke, when he writes, writes him this way, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. A man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. As I said, the church is probably only about four years old, and all of its organization is still being created. And, and the, they didn't get proactive. They, they were reactive. Things would happen, and they would choose to do this. And, and here are the people. You know, Stephen was one of the first men. Stephen would have been a committed Jew. Stephen would have been a faithful Jew. Perhaps he came from somewhere else in the Roman Empire, and he was one of the ones who came on Pentecost, and he maybe was one of the 3,000. Or maybe he was a part of the more Grecian contingent of Jews who lived in the Holy Land all along. We don't know all of those things. But what we do know is that from his faith in the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and worshiping the God of Moses— he came to realize that Jesus was the Messiah that the scriptures had pointed to, Jesus who died on the cross, Jesus who rose from the dead, Jesus now was his Lord and Savior, and Jesus changed Stephen's life. Stephen would be an example of what John wrote about believing in Jesus' name because of the testimony of the eyewitnesses. Jesus changed his life. Jesus became the answer to his life's search. So the foundation of Stephen's experience, his life was, it was a vital commitment to and a strong connection with Jesus, and he was growing. So here it is, four years after the resurrection and the beginning of the church. And, and here's Stephen, who's been a, a believer for maybe less than four years. And look at him. He is already considered to be full of wisdom and full of the Spirit and ready for an opportunity to serve the Lord. How long have you been a believer? How long have you worked with Jesus? Where are you in that trajectory of useful service and growth and fruitfulness and following the example of Stephen's life as he committed his own life to Christ. Well, from the foundation, we talk a little bit this morning about the motivation of Stephen's life. 
and that Stephen was humble and he was available. When the call came for him to serve, he agreed to do that. And, and there was a great need because, as I said before, this could have been tremendously damaging and separating. This could have been like a cleaver right down the middle of the church and splitting it into two very, very different groups, two hostile groups right from the get-go. But Stephen and, and the six others, they were, they were available when the need arose, they were willing. They were available, they were willing. And as they were prayed over and the hands were laid upon them, they yielded their freedoms, they yielded their time, they yielded their energy, they yielded their effort, they yielded their heart because they decided that they wanted to serve the body of Christ. And, and they were successful. How do I know they were successful? Well, it is at the end of that paragraph, then in verse 7, it says, The word of God continued to increase. The number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and many of the priests became obedient to faith. What Stephen and the others did provided a, a basis in terms of a healing and things taking place that the actual core ministry can continue to grow and continue to thrive and continue to prosper. Jesus' desire is that his body be whole. His body be whole and his body be well. Jesus' desire is that his body resolves conflict well. And, and, and what a great example of resolving conflict. Perhaps you've been a part of a congregation that didn't do that so well, and you saw it split right down the middle. I've had the sad uh, opportunity to observe and be aware of that in different ways. It takes maturity. It takes leadership. It takes hard work and commitment. It takes the willing to put other people ahead of oneself. It's, it takes the ability to put Jesus first, um, you know, in our own lives. How are you learning to do that in your life? Well, I'd like to consider the, the example of Stephen's life, because in a way, when you look at the situation, Stephen is that the man that we need for just a time as this. He is that kind of a person. He's described as a man of good reputation. And, and what that means is that people had good things to say about him. They would talk about the things that he'd already been doing. They would talk about his heart attitude. They would talk about his character. And so he had a stellar reputation among that branch of the church. He was spoken very, very well of. Not only did he have that reputation, but he was also full of the Spirit. That can be a, a, a nebulous term to really get around to be able to define in a, in a totally clear way, but as, as I would read being full of the Holy Spirit, he would have a deep, deep sensitivity to Jesus and listening for Christ's word through the word, um, that, that Jesus' character spills out in his life because the Holy Spirit's ministry is to produce Jesus in us. And so Jesus is like spilling out in his life, in his words, um, his life would be characterized by the fruit of the Holy Spirit, of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. All of those things are being expressed in his life. There's a maturity about him, and he's full of wisdom. He has discernment. He doesn't have just knowledge of the scriptures and knowledge of the Lord, but he can take the knowledge and then he can apply it practically to life. And on top of all of that uh, would be humility. It then says in verse 8 that Stephen was full of grace and power. Stephen was full of grace and power. He would be a strong, strong, vital leader who was humble. He would be a person who has power, but if he's full of grace, he's not obnoxious. If he's full of grace, but he has power, he has strength, and he's going to actually accomplish things. That what a character it would be, you know, for you and for me, if, if those things could be said about us in our lives, the, the impact that you and I could have uh, for the Lord. And then fourthly, I'd think, like to think about the pattern of uh, Stephen's life in terms of the things that he did. 
In verse 8, again, it says, Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people and wisdom with which he was speaking. The picture in there is that Stephen was doing as much, if not more, than Jesus did as Jesus was healing and teaching. Stephen was very, very active, and it was the active of, of spreading grace to people. It's, it's, this is behind the scenes. You don't hear that. But if he's full of grace and power and doing wonders and signs, what are the wonders and signs? They're blessing people with healing. They're, they're healing diseases. Maybe a few people are being raised from the dead. Maybe some blind people are seeing and deaf people are hearing. And Stephen is accomplishing that. What did Jesus say in John 14? Greater things than I'm doing, you are going to do when you are abide in me. And here is Stephen being a fulfillment of that. And so the pattern of his life is to serve in the spirit and the kinds of things that Jesus did. But then the pattern of his life was he started actually living out some of the things that Jesus had said. In John chapter 15, beginning with verse 18, Jesus writes this, If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you are of the world, the world would love you, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember, I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they kept mine, they will keep yours. And he goes on to talk about the response of the world. And that is what Stephen experienced. So that when we get to the verses we stopped before that here, the people could not withstand the wisdom with which he was speaking. And then they instigated men who would say we heard him blaspheme against Moses and God. He never ceases to speak words against this holy place and the law. And they, they were basically having a, a kind of a trial, not un unlike what Jesus went through that last night of his life. What was the object of Stephen's life? Well, one of the ways you can find out the object is to read his, his address in chapter 7, which we don't really have time to do this morning. But, but as, you, as you see what Stephen is about, Jesus, Stephen is about truth, and Stephen is about the glory of Jesus. His address is the truth of the scriptures that you and I call the Old Testament and the history of Israel, and pointing to Christ as the fulfillment of everything that they had hoped for. Behind the words here, he, you, you have a sense that he was going back even to John chapter 2, excuse me, where, where Jesus talks about um, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Yeah, so Stephen is talking about Jesus and, uh, you know, and maybe the temple is not really necessary anymore because of what Jesus has done. And so he's not, Jesus, Stephen isn't really speaking against, but he's just clarifying and his message rehearses God's work and God's word. It begins with Abraham and Joseph and Moses. And even in it, he talks about Israel's hardness of heart, rejecting the people and rejecting what God wanted. And so Stephen, at his heart, he was not, he was not sharing this to condemn them, but truly, as in Peter's spirit, to call them to repentance. Call them to repentance. But the object of his life in, in the truth and the glory of Jesus is he's going to be faithful. He's going to be faithful. You know, the earlier chapters of the book of Acts sees Peter and others preaching. He sees them being arrested and, and mistreated a number of different times and, uh, and going forth and being faithful in the face of all of that. And Stephen is determined to maintain faithfulness even in the face of of such hostility. Well, what are the results? What are the results of Stephen's faith? Well, in Acts chapter 2, Peter preached and it says the people were cut to the heart as Peter talked about the crucifixion of Christ. But they were cut to the heart 
in a way that they repented and they turned. 3,000 people became believers. Stephen, in Acts chapter 7, he's preaching, and, and they aren't exactly cut to the heart, but it says they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him, and they were determined to kill him at that point. And we, we read that passage a little bit earlier. Here again, you know, he's experiencing something similar to what Jesus did. This is an illegal event. This isn't even a trial. There's no judgment faced. There's no verdict placed. It becomes an angry mob that takes him off and is bound and determined to kill him. And at that point, as they are getting ready to stone him, it says, He full of the Spirit gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Wherever else we read about Jesus in heaven, it talks about him being seated at the right hand of God. But here, this is a, he's not seated, he is standing. And it, what, what I picture is like a parent, and, and you're watching your child participate in an athletic event, and you're seeing a competition, and, and all of a sudden the energy is great, and the tension is great, and the risk is great, and the need is strong, and what do you do? You get out of your seat, and you get up, and you're looking, and you're paying attention, and you want to see what happens, because you can't just sit and watch. And, and here is the king. Here is the king. And he's watching from heaven and seeing Stephen as he's responding to these charges. And, and the battle is engaged and Jesus stands up. And, and I personally can't help but think he's leaning forward and he's looking so intently at his servant. And, and he's anticipating what, what's he going to say next? What's he going to do next? He knows Stephen is going to be faithful and he, he's wanting Stephen to... No, he's urging him on. You have my approval. You have my love, my son. And, and Stephen confesses the Lord who is so fully invested and so fully loves him. Stephen is about to experience the reality of Psalm 116 that said, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of the saints. Stephen is going to experience that. And uh, just the joy of Jesus seeing one of his own be faithful even unto death. Or Revelation 2, when Jesus says to the church, Be faithful unto death and you will receive the crown of life. In an interesting, I don't know if it's exactly irony or not, but Stephen's name, Stephen in Greek, is crown and uh, receiving the crown of victory. So one of the results of all of this is it ushers Stephen into the presence of the Lord. But this is also the action that seems to have changed Saul. It really sparked him. You know, Saul, at this point, watching this, he already has a hatred for Christ and the church. But, but this event, it just sets him loose, and, and he can no longer stand idly by. This movement has to be stopped, and we'll see in chapter 8 and then in chapter 9, he's ready, and he's going off to persecute. He's going to arrest. He's going to imprison. Some others will be killed. In fact, he reflects back on uh, Acts in Acts chapter 22. He reflects back on this time with Stephen. Acts chapter 22, verse 20. When the blood of Stephen, your witness, was being shed, I myself was standing by and approving and watching over the garments of those who killed him. Said those words to Jesus when he saw Jesus. Now that was going to come in just a little time. What were the results of Stephen's faithfulness? Well, a persecution arose, a great persecution arose. It's amazing how small an action can cause a very, very great explosion. That happens many times in history. I think that if the right event were to happen today, the world would change in a way that you and I wouldn't recognize, and it would change very fast because we have no idea that the hatred and animosity towards all things of Christ, and we just to pray that the Lord would strengthen you and me to be faithful. 
But as the persecution came, it caused believers to flee Jerusalem. And as they fled Jerusalem and areas in Judea, they went off to Samaria. That's where Philip went in Acts chapter 8. Philip is there and uh, a whole bunch of Samaritans come to know the Lord. And then, then he meets someone from Africa, an Ethiopian, and he comes to know the Lord. And they spread out further and further. Some of them may make it to Antioch, which comes into the story in Acts chapter 13. And uh, that leads to uh, more activity on the part of Saul and uh, uh, Jesus, Stephen's, um, the actions of Stephen ultimately set in motion the events where Saul meets Jesus, the same Jesus that Stephen saw. But that's a, that's a story for next week. And so even in the midst of this tragic event in Stephen's life, God is at work and God is very, very active. Well, for you and me, as we think about how the resurrection of Christ and the risen Christ impacted Stephen's life, let's think a little bit about ourselves. Well, first of all, Stephen was just a man. He was just a man like you and me, and he had an impact that was so powerful. I don't know that you or I will ever have an impact quite like that, but an individual like you and me can have a tremendous impact for Christ if we are simply faithful, if we are faithful to Jesus, if we are available to him, if, if we are genuine in our Christian character and our outlook, if our, we have a priority to serve the body of Christ and to build up the body of Christ, if we have to consider the cost of discipleship, you know, Jesus already spoke about not denying him and that, that we would not deny Christ under the pressure, that we would be willing to be known as belonging to him, that we would not water down or compromise the gospel to try to make it be accepted, that we would put Jesus first above our spouse, above our children, above our parents, above the things in life. It's not that we don't love them, but Jesus comes first and then through us to, to re lead them uh, to him because there's no guarantee that you won't pay a price with your family or you won't pay a price with your friends. You won't pay a price at work or with your peers if you are following Jesus faithfully. There's been a, a theme that has I've seen around a number of times over this last week, and I think it epitomizes uh, Stephen for us. Uh, in this world, it's about in life in this world, there, there are five things that Jesus did not say. Jesus did not say, follow your own heart. Jesus said, follow me. We read that earlier. Jesus did not say, be true to yourself. But as we read earlier, he said, be my disciple, deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and follow me. Jesus didn't say, believe in yourself. He said, you believe in God, believe also in me. Jesus did not say, live your truth. That is a huge phrase these days. Jesus said, if you're my disciple, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The world says, be happy. You deserve happiness. Jesus said, what will it profit a person if he gains the whole world but loses or forfeits his soul? No, Stephen didn't do that. Stephen is a living example of following. Stephen is a living example of authenticity to Christ. In person today, we're beginning our worship service with a part of what's called the Heidelberg Catechism. And it begins like this. What is your only comfort in life and death? That I am not my own, but I belong body and soul, both in life and death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from the power of the devil. He will preserve me in such a way that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, all things must work together for my salvation. 
Therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing and ready from now on to live and to die for him. It's said that John Wesley said that every believer should be ready at any time to pray, to preach, or to die. Every believer should be ready to call out to the Lord in prayer. Every believer should be ready to preach or talk to someone else about Jesus. Every believer should be ready to sacrifice, to put something away, to stop something, to stop doing something, to give something up, um, and maybe to die, because that is the call. That is where that may, in fact, happen. I think of Jim Elliott, who in 1956 died as one of the group of martyrs down in Ecuador. I mentioned Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was uh, executed um, at the end of World War II um, by, for his, uh, his uh, work against Hitler. The man who uh, oversaw Stephen's martyrdom would one day write this, that the suffering of death cannot compare to the glory of heaven. But then he also wrote in uh, Philippians chapter 3 that I may know Christ, that I may know the power of his resurrection and sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection of the dead. That you and I look to that, that our faithfulness lasts. And, and in that faithfulness, we become aware of those who are suffering. One of the missions that we support in different ways is a voice of the martyrs, because martyrdom was not just a first century uh, event. Martyrdom is happening all around the world today. And one of the ways that we can learn from Stephen's life is that we can care for those who are, in fact, laying down their lives today to serve Jesus. We can care for their families. We can pray for those circumstances. We can pray for people's protection. We can seek to do things that will encourage them. Voice of the Martyrs is the name of the organization, otherwise known as VOM. I uh, was happy to give you some information or you can find them uh, online. But something that I would strongly encourage you to, to develop a heart for your brothers and sisters who are suffering in their way. Faith in the resurrection of Christ changes things. And it changes lives. And he will change your life. He will continue to work in your life. May he do that and, and strengthen you and me to exhibit more of the traits and characters that Stephen did. And may he use us in, in ways that will advance his work, bringing more and more people to know Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for men like Stephen and women like Stephen, and men are not the only ones who are martyrs. Some of the most famous early church martyrs were, in fact, young women, um, whether male or female. Lord, those lives have mattered. You love them. You have known them. Thank you that you have welcomed them into paradise, and they, they await the final resurrection. Lord, strengthen us. We, we don't live in a time of such overt persecution at this moment. We learn we may live in various levels of opposition. We pray that what we experience will confirm us even more in our commitment to you and our faith in you and our willingness to make a difference. And Sometimes the people that are the angriest are the people that are actually the closest and the neediest. And so we pray that you would work in our lives uh, to reach out to them. Father, we thank you for Stephen's example. May that be an example that helps us to glorify you as well. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, friends, thank you for joining us this morning. God bless you and God strengthen you as you go forth and serve him today. Amen.